At Bridgewater, Karen, um, you're studying historical cause-effect relationships to make sense of the economy and markets. What makes investing so interesting and exasperating, though, is that often reliable relationships break down. The beauty of macro is to look for such anomalies and exploit them, like what is happening that shouldn't, what isn't happening that should. So let's run, few, run through a few of those anomalies. So six months ago, equities were rallying in anticipation of lower interest rates. But now we've seen you today, equities are rallying despite higher bond yields. So with a strong economy and inflation less of an issue, are you reverting to the typical inverse relationship between equities and bonds? You know, the relationship between equities and bonds, it's not an immutable fact of life. It's just not a just thing that occurs. It's a function of the fundamental building blocks in stocks and bonds. And when you look at stocks and bonds, they have a lot of things in common. Like, they're all future cash flows you're discounting to today, so if you raise that, it's bad for both. And they both don't do great when inflation is strong. The real inverse comes from their reaction to growth, for the reason you're saying. You know, if, you know, if growth is strong, then you can get equities rising, and at the same time, you can actually get the central bank tightening in response to that growth, which is bad for the bonds. And Actually, the anomaly has been the years leading up to 2022, where inflation was just kind of a non-factor, and the only dominant macro issue was growth. And so we've gotten really used to the idea that stocks and bonds have this inverse relationship, but that's actually the anomaly. It's not that normal to have a world where inflation just doesn't matter. And finally, you know, we lived through this period where it's like, wait a minute, inflation, its gravitational pull was kind of to such a low level, it was irrelevant. It's becoming relevant again, and we got this positive correlation where they both did badly because you need to tighten in response to that inflation kind of rearing its head. Today, knock on wood, we look like we're back to a world where inflation is not a non-issue, but is not a dominant issue, where we can have the kind of market action we've enjoyed so far in 2024, where we find out growth's pretty damn resilient, growth's doing great, companies can do well, earnings can do well, and at the same time, the Fed can ease less than expected or tighten relative to expectations at the same time. If they were tightening to stop very bad inflation, that would be a very different outcome. So the fundamental question as an investor is sort of, where is the gravitational pull of inflation going to be? Is this going to be a major topic that then leads stocks and bonds sometimes to act the same way, or is it going to go back to being kind of a non-issue? So which would you overweight, stocks or bonds? One word answer. In the U.S. For the next 12 months. Stocks. Stocks in the U.S. A second anomaly. For the last 50 years, we've seen the U.S. budget deficit around, average around 3%, and it's projected to be 6% over the next decade. So far, we have seen markets being willing to finance these record deficits, in contrast to the U.K., for example. How come? You know, I think the best answer to this starts with actually the current account deficits, because obviously that's part of who's, you know, buying all the uh, bonds we're issuing. And it is a really weird anomaly, because the United States is buying way more foreign goods than they're buying ours. And typically, if countries do that, their currency is weak because they have to convince someone to hold all the currency on the other side of that. So they have to attract all this financing. The, the United States is running a massive current account deficit, and yet the dollar's strong because what's happening on the other end is people are just so enthusiastic about buying dollar financial assets. It's so extreme that I think the United States has kind of a version of a Dutch disease. So the classic Dutch disease is like, you're Saudi Arabia, you have oil. No one's buying oil because you're Saudi Arabia. No one's thinking, I really want Saudi oil. They just need to fill up their car, their car, right? So whatever the gas is, the gas is. But as Saudi Arabia, you get kind of uncompetitive outside of it because money's flooding in just for your oil for nothing else. The United States has kind of become that on financial assets, which is people aren't really thinking, I just want US financial assets. It's just the United States financial assets have done so well. They're like the dominant part of the index in stocks and in bonds. So anyone that needs to save any money around the world just ends up in US assets. As long as you care at all about market cap, which anyone reasonable would, and you're going to the big market around the world, if you're saving, you're giving the United States money. And so we're ending up with this flood of money that is a huge anomaly where we actually have a rising currency making everything else kind of uncompetitive because people just want to buy stocks and bonds. And no one else enjoys that, so we can run these huge deficits and sort of not worry about it. How do you explain the next anomaly, which is this? Europe is grappling with war, an energy crisis, subdued demand from China, 
Germany's on the verge of recession. The US passed the IRA and CHIPS Act, which supercharged the manufacturing construction. You've got the introduction of ChatGPT, which launched an AI boom, and America has most of the AI winners in the public markets. So how come the German stock market, since October 2022, the bear market low, has outperformed S&P 500 by 15% in US dollar terms? So I'd say a couple of things. One is that it's too easy to look at what market outcomes are and not ask what was the discounting ahead of that, right? And so you're starting in a world where expectations of Europe were pretty damn bad at the spot you're saying. People are kind of saying, Europe's garbage. I don't want to be here. They're just totally a mess. That means that Europe can have worse outcomes than, say, the United States, certainly Germany, and still outperform in price terms because the expectations starting are just so low. And we're still kind of in that world where US expectations are just so much better than everybody else's that we can look back in a couple of years and say the US has done so much better than everybody and its assets may not because that's already expected, that's already in the price. The other thing I'll say is, look, European governments, and Germany in particular, they didn't do nothing here, right? So typically, if you get Russia invading Ukraine, and now you're Europe, and you're getting this disastrous inflation, where suddenly prices are rising to a level where, you know, you just, as a business, you have to pass that on, or your margins are just going to be destroyed, right? If you don't have the government step in and do something about it, businesses do awfully. That's why rising inflation is usually pretty bad for business. But if the government steps in and helps people be able to pay for these higher costs, businesses can pass it on. And that's what you saw, is that European businesses were able to pass on those extra costs because of government support. So without that, you would have had a way bigger disaster. And then the last thing I'll say is, I think it's a little bit overdone, the idea that every AI winner and every tech winner is in the United States. Yes, obviously there are a lot. A lot of that's also in the price. But you know, if you're DAX, you have SAP, you have Simmons that has a partnership with NVIDIA. If you're broader Europe, you have, a you have ASML. Like, it's not like that's the only place in the world where there's anyone that has to do with the AI boom. So in 2011, the dollar index was around 72. Um, gold was priced at $1,900. We've seen the dollar increase over 40% since then. US 10-year real rates have moved to 2%, highest since 2007, and yet gold is sitting above $2,200. What does gold know that we don't? So I'd start with saying this is absolutely an anomaly, right? Because gold is, as you say, being priced in dollar terms, and when dollar is unbelievably strong, all else equal, you know, if nothing's changed for gold, it shouldn't be rising 40% along with the dollar. And so the fact that gold's risen as much as the dollar, another way of seeing it is if you look at gold in kind of global currency terms, like you're a European, you're in yen, you're like, wow, gold's risen a ton, even more than you'd kind of see in dollar terms. And then, as you kind of alluded to, interest rates are much higher, so gold is kind of like a currency that refuses to pay you an interest rate. When everything was zero, that's fine. The minute there are interest rates on other things, it should be competitive. You should be saying, wait a minute, I'm less interested in gold now that I can actually get an interest rate on another currency. So the fact that gold is up as much as it is, it's telling you that there are buyers out there that are willing to overlook the lack of interest rates and say, despite that, I want more gold than I did before that have caused the value of gold to go up as much as it has. And it's easiest to see this not in dollar terms because the dollar's been so strong. So you really want to say more like in euro terms and yen terms, wow, gold has been unbelievably strong. And I think we know who those people are, right? And it's not a surprise, which is if you are worried about geopolitical problems, if you are looking and saying, wait a minute, I look at what happened to Russia, I want to make sure I don't have all of my assets in fiat currencies that could be confiscated. The dollar, the euro, the, the pound, none of these are amazing options. There really aren't such good options. You're kind of stuck. Gold is one of your only options, and the gold market's not huge. So it doesn't take a tremendous number of players worrying about this problem and saying, I'd like to have a little bit in gold to create the kind of price action that we've seen. The final and perhaps biggest and most persistent anomaly. Why do otherwise smart people make stupid decisions when it comes to money? <laughs> and remembering your late senior thesis advisor, Daniel Kahneman, what wisdom can you share? Well, I love that you raised this because uh, Danny Kahneman is definitely the reason I ended up in this line of business because I was just so fascinated with this idea. And I think the answer is money is not different than other issues that are emotionally salient for people, right? And so when Danny did 
um, this kind of research where you ask people questions like, you know, is this person more likely to be a bank teller or a bank teller who cares about feminism? And people pick the latter when that's, you know, simple probabilistic changes. It's because people get emotionally attached to things. If they ask, what's, what's more, do you more likely to die at a terrorist attack or a car ride? It's an emotionally salient thing. Money is emotional for people. And he was early in figuring out that losses mattered to people emotionally, gains mattered to people differently. People thought about money in ways that then skewed their ability, frankly, to just make logical decisions. And that what drew me to this line of work, what drew me to Bridgewater, was the idea that we have this system one versus system two. So we have as humans the ability to take our time, separate ourselves from those emotions and those biases, write down our reasoning, and kind of look at them very objectively. We have that ability. We just don't always choose to do it. We might have a bad day and emotions take us over. And so the idea of investing with that discipline uh, was really what got me excited about being here. Thank you, Karen.